When MasterChef started taking off, it wasn't traditional good cop, bad cop, the mean judge. We just slipped into this positive conversation. So different to normal reality TV, which was always negative, negative, negative. Most reality TV is very convected and very unreal. And, and everybody walks away feeling like they're an utter failure. Never did it. That's one big reason why MasterChef Australia worked so well in India, right? You know, you don't want to be screamed and shouted at. You don't want to work in a kitchen where you, you, you're ignored. You need to be encouraged by someone. Never underestimate the fact that why people go out is not to eat your food. They go out to have a really good time with their friends and your job is for your food and your service to enhance that experience. For me, India kind of, it's endless. Like everywhere I go, there's something new. If I want to spend three hours watching people cook delicious Indian food, I can do that now. In the old days, I have to hop on a plane and fly for 12 hours. I always say this, that in one's lifetime, no one can try everything what's available in India. Gary's going to try. I'm <laughs> having a good go. And maybe we'll get a chance to cook together sometime. Yes, I would love to cook some good Indian food for both of you. What's up guys, Sanjot Keer here. Welcome to the first ever podcast episode on YFL. Often I meet a lot of legends and geniuses from the culinary world. And usually those conversations are so insightful, there is so much to learn that I often feel that all of these insights should be shared with you for people who want to become chefs, who want to make it big in the culinary world or want to do something in the food scene. And recently I got this opportunity to meet two legends uh, who have been an inspiration to me since I was a kid. Uh, and I'm sure the whole of India loves them through their show Master of Australia. Former MasterChef Australia judges, celebrated chef Gary Mehegan and celebrated food critic, writer and TV presenter Matt Preston. Uh, this conversation was so insightful, there was so much for me to learn and I'm sure that anybody who wants to become a chef or wants to make a name for themselves in the culinary world is going to learn a lot from this conversation. And also a special thanks to Kanosh, uh, which is a food lovers community, which brings in so many culinary legends together to do workshops, to do food events. And this podcast was possible because of them. So thank you so much, Kanosh. So guys, this is an action-packed, really insightful conversation, and I'm sure you're going to love it. Let's deep dive into it. Okay, uh, uh, I have Chef Gary and uh, Matt, sir. Uh, it's it's a pleasure to be with you in the same room, and uh, it's an honor. I've been looking forward to I don't know why he's saying that, because he's one of the biggest platforms in India, and I, I watch know. his stuff. I know, I know, I know. and, and it's fantastic. And you, you learn so much from him, so much great Indian stuff to cook. It's amazing. Thank you so much. I'm so glad to hear that. I, I really uh, feel uh, honored. Um, We've been trying to, uh, you know, catch up. You've yeah. spoken a couple of times, and yeah. he's, um, very, he's very elusive. <laughs> he's, he's like a snow leopard. He's no, there, and then he's not. It's more that I've got a short memory, and I go, I must reach out, <laughs> and then I forget. <laughs> no, but you've been traveling to India yeah. a lot, yeah. um, and to start on a very lighter note, uh, do you follow cricket? Uh, do we talk about the cricket? It's, it's. I've had lots of broken heart emojis from all over India because we did so well. <laughs> I can't believe it. We thought we were going to get mauled. Yeah, I, I was at the stadium actually Were watching the match, about yes, and I've still oh. been heartbroken. Yeah. And for a moment, I sort of like was hating whole of Australia and Australians, but I'm here. We don't have that relationship. <laughs> India, and, India and Australia do not have that relationship. Yeah, but, no hate. Oh, there'll be a few times. <laughs> Andrew Simons, maybe. Um, you know what? I, I said to someone the other day, it, it was India Rolls the best team in the tournament. But what I love about moments like that is actually that adversity brings the country together. Right. And this country where everyone speaks a different language and will argue where their best food is. Yeah. All, everyone in India, regardless of where they were, regardless of everything, they all were like, oh no, it was yeah. terrible. Yeah, so we, I, we all were heartbroken, but yes, mm. uh, it was a great, great show. Um, but I want to tell you, uh, apart from the Australian cricket team, uh, I guess you guys are one of the most famous uh, Aussies here in India. And uh, India loves you. So that, that and, well, the cricketers obviously, you know, because everybody, if, if you're Brett Lee or Shane Warne, God yeah. bless his soul, you know, guys like this, obviously more famous. And then we were told, I think, a few years ago that Pack to the Rafters and MasterChef were two of the biggest Australian shows. Yes. So we share that hallowed kind of ground with Rebecca Gibney, etc. Uh, although, although I would, I would take issue with the word famous because I think we're more familiar rather than famous. And comfortable. I think, 
I think it's a different thing. Familiarity is different right, from fame. Right. The, the relationship, you know, there was a couple of kids had driven up from, had driven up j just to meet us, and they were like, hi, and it was like, it was like they were meeting an old school friend. Oh, and yeah. that, that interaction is very different rather than that kind of shaking and autograph book. You actually have a proper conversation. That, that, I, I value that yeah, more, and it's a fami the familiarity as well. I really you value. described it once, certainly in Australia, and, and it's been the same in India, is that there's this kind of casual familiarity, but in a sense, in in this way, you know, it's the guy that owns the shop down the road, you know, hi Gaz, or the postman, you know, yeah. hi Gary, you know, like when MasterChef started taking off, unlike say, you know, your regular celebrity and, you know, getting papped and clicked and whatever, we just seem to have this um, man next door or guys right. next door mm -hmm. kind of, um, you know, people perceived us to be just like their friends. And right. so, you know, my wife very early on would say, you know, somebody would go, hey, Gary. And I go, hey, how are you? And she go, who's that? I go, I've got no idea. Because it was that, that kind of thing. And it's been, it was always been like that. And yeah. same in India, particularly. Right, that connection, I think, uh, is something. Do you think that's one big reason why MasterChef Australia worked so sure. well in India? I think it's one of those shows, those international shows. I think it's more famous than many shows what happen in India, right? Sure. And so many people I come across. Uh, I want to know from both of you, what do you feel is that one reason or a couple of reasons that MasterChef Australia did so well in India? For me, uh, personally, I'll tell you, it is the three of you. Mm. Uh, we don't have George with us today, but it's the three of you. But what do you think it really is that it worked in India? You go first. From, the, from day dot, it was this moment. It's a great concept, let's be honest. It's right. a great franchise. It's, uh, um, there was something special about that. I mean, the, the executive producers of the show had, had a fabulous concept of supersizing this uh, English show that had been around for years but right. in a very kind of colloquial and, and uh, very different way than what it, what it was you know first aired in Australia and I remember Paul Franklin who was one of our execs and somebody that we both look up to, up to you know he'd sat us on these stools you know we started filming had a loose idea of what we were about to do and after we judged a few of the contestants he just came up you know in amongst the lights you know when there are 140 people around you and just came in real close and said I don't know what you're doing but just keep doing it because it's different. Wow. And I think it was that we just found this immediate rhythm of just being, because we can't be anything else, of being honest and genuine and trustworthy and wanting to impart our, all the information that we can to help you know, right. other people. And that's part of hospitality, that's right. what it is. Absolutely. Right? You know, so I think it was that people, you know, it wasn't traditional bad, good cop, bad cop, you know, the, the mean judge. We just slipped into this positive conversation right. with, with a little negative at the beginning, to, to point out the flaws or where they could improve, but then always part of positive feedback right. to help it along. So different to normal reality TV, which was always negative, negative, negative. And if you were lucky, you had a positive. I mean, I watched Dancing with the Stars, for example, a big franchise in Australia. Right. And uh, the judges would go, you know, wow, you know, what a great job you did. What a fabulous dance. And then they go, but, and then it's negative, negative, negative. Mm. And, and everybody walks away feeling like they're an utter failure. Never did it. I absolutely agree with that. Actually, there was a lot of feel-good factor you yeah. know, while watching the show and watching all of you. I think, I think, it, I think, I think there's, a real, there's a real danger that we, we see this as something that's planned. You, you know what it's like working yes. in television. There's never a time to plan stuff. Right. So it has to come from a place of authenticity. It has to be something that is about, um, about trying to be real. Most reality TV is very, is very convected and very unreal. And I think for me, the success was built around contestants that were like Australians you knew, and a really broad base mm. of Australians right. from all different backgrounds, which is yeah. really important. That's not what you get to see normally on reality TV shows, you know? It, it, tends, to be, it tends to be very, very monochrome. Um, the other thing is, the other thing is we wanted, we, we were told very early on, this, this again was Paul Franklin's um, great line, he said, if you don't love the contestants, then yeah. why would anyone at home be interested yeah. in them? Yeah. Why, why would anyone want to love them? So I think from very early on, we were, we were engaged in being, you know, to use a Bette Midler song, we, we, were the wind, we were the wind beneath their wings, <laughs> you know? <laughs> we're, trying to lift, we're trying to lift them up right, the whole time. Right. And I think that's what made it special. And the fact that, and, you know, it's, it's invested. And, and the fact that they all, we, you know, because there's that great environment, we didn't, we didn't broach any bad behavior, you know? They, they were, collegiate they got on they helped each other they'd go home after a day's cooking in the studio and they would they would 
all the three groups would make paella and then they'd discuss which is the best paella and well. Yeah. So they, they, were, they, were, they were training themselves, which is why you got that amazing pace yeah. of development. Right. But, but, but we, we pushed them though. I mean, I was sent yeah. in as the, uh, do you remember for a, a few times on a few contestants, can you go and have a chat with mm. them? And I think you probably did the same. Um, and we invested our time, you know, hook, line and sinker. Like, you were so invested in them. By the time we got to the top, top ten, we'd fallen in love with them. Right? But, but, um, but, but also that investment didn't end with the show. And I, and I think that's one of the really unique things about MasterChef is that we're still friends with so many of them. And we've, wow. now, they're, now they're our peers, you know. And uh, I, had, I, had, I had a text from Julie Goodwin yesterday. You talked to Poe, you know. Like this is, but this is constant. If you look at our phones, you'll see these names, all right. these familiar yeah. names popping yeah. up. Because, because, you know, I think initially the mentorship continued after the left as they wanted to make the life in food. And now they're ringing up saying we're doing this or how about doing mm. that or we've got an idea about that or I've just seen this, do you like that? Yeah. I think that's really, that's really exciting. That, that makes those nine months you spent a year with a group of people valid because it wasn't done for television. And I think that's what people picked up on. They picked up on the same fundamentals that make everyone here, you know, yeah. everyone here in India loves to sit around the table and enjoy a meal with their family. That's, yeah. That, that's the essence of, of home, and that's what the show tried to capture, and that's why it's resonated. You know what's funny, and i just got to add to that, because it's, it's a funny transition from, you know, it goes beyond the show, the relationships go beyond the show, which is not normal. Um, and I remember dishing out business advice to, you know, five or six different contestants. Yeah. Like, I remember standing outside of Matt Sinclair's yeah, sure. first restaurant with, yeah. you know, leased on the yeah. on the front door and, and knowing you know how much you know talking through along yeah. with George etc and talking through you know what the model should not should be but you know what are the pitfalls you know where mm. you know w what your ratios are all this kind of thing you know and um, now of course you know I might ring him and say have you got that recipe for the thing you're doing you know like or uh, Rose Adam you know Rose Adams would be the same you know I said to her, you know what you know what do you do what's that cream that you use or what's that proportion of that and first time you do it they're a bit shocked I go, hey, fair enough. You know, you've been in business now for five, six, seven. I mean, Bo's been in business for, you know, 12 years or so. Right. And so they've become professionals and now colleagues, or, you know, as Matt says, in their own right. And so it's a very different relationship. And I really love it. Like Mandy Hall, who I saw when she first came, I was really critical of her. You know, she was an older, la you know, an old lady. Her children were getting older. She had finally had time to compete on the show. And I thought her, I didn't think she was being genuine. And I was always a bit rough on the ones, wasn't I, that was, I didn't think were being genuine. And I'd take them aside and go, hey, do it for the right reasons. And I'd give them a little pep talk. And she has just done, she's gone off on a tangent. She's did a, a, a degree in kind of, what was it, in kind of m she, micro. She, she's, now running, she's now running a really big government program okay. for reducing yeah. food waste. Oh, wow. So, you know, she's, she's now having a massive interest in that space. Yeah. I mean, she went away and set up a business making really good miso, which we all benefited from. Well, that's from. what I'm saying. She went and did and a university and degree in, right. in, you know, I was, think it was like microbiology or something like that, which in, in the food space, where she learned to do cheese and all the rest of it. Wow. And I just went totally unexpected. Uh, and, but, but I think what's interesting is that, what interesting, historically food was seen as being something that it was a job that you went into, like being a car mechanic. Yeah, it was a job with your hands. And, and I think what, what we've seen here in this trip to India so we last, I was last year four years ago, and I think you, you, you'd feel the same. There's a whole new generation of, of kind of like MasterChef kids who are 20 to 26, who are now cooking, mm. they're, in, they're, they're setting up food businesses, they're working, in, they're working in kitchens, we've got a team of 10 of them working with us across these dinners, right. and they're brilliant. And, and they're, they're very different from that, that old style hotel chef. These yeah. are kids who are gonna have yeah. their own restaurant in five years, they know where they're going, they're driven, Right. That's exciting for us to see that maybe we just, we're just like, you know. A little bit of inspiration. A, a little bit of a spark, a no. tiny spark. Well, let, let, me, let me tell you one thing. There's actually so much to take in and, uh, you know, so much to talk about. But one thing what I got from this is that being real is very important. Yeah. Uh, because there's no real in reality today. So yeah. that's one thing which we need it's to gotta be honest you know, learn yourself, and understand. Right? That, because that is what works. Yeah. Two is being very genuine with whatever you do. Like put in all of your heart and do yeah. it with complete will yeah. and love and that is what I'm just feeling right now while talking to both of you that it's it there's no there's no uh, kind of a you know sheer in between us it's it's just it's free-flowing yeah. yeah and what you spoke about the new generation uh, you know coming up and trying to make a mark in the food scene one of the biggest reasons happened because of uh, your show and people have learned so many techniques have learned about 
so many new names you know that okay this is called this and yeah. this dish is you know made like this and people wanted to go out and try and that's what i think the show and uh, it's through you that uh, you know there are bigger doors which have opened and not just back home in your country but in ours as well and i feel that's incredible uh, but i also want to know is uh, because of this connect with india uh, because through the show mm. how has indian food and the indian culinary scene inspired you in your lives mm. both professionally and also when you cook at home maybe for your family uh, how has that uh, you know changed how you think about food or maybe you know some inspiration sure. i mean to put it you know it's not just India. It's you know to put it in perspective. I I trained as a French, a classically French trained chef. You know, I worked at the Connaught, which was like a bastion of haute cuisine, a Michelin star restaurant in London for four years. Michel Bourdin was a chef, and you know what he uh, instilled in us. You know, it was all about you know process and technique and delivery. We had to earn the right to every recipe we ever cooked in that kitchen. Like it was an amazing kitchen. But when I first travelled overseas, all of a sudden I went, why didn't I train as a French chef? Because it's just, a, as you know, it's just a constant source of, you know, deliciousness, let's be honest. You know, first time to Japan, first time to Vietnam, first time to... I remember standing, you know, a 25-year-old standing, you know, eating in Singapore in Little India and going, my first real experience of, you know, uh, Indian food, you know, a tali, you know, with a big right. puffy puri. I'm going, what is this? What's this bread? You know, I just remember that. And dropping down into Australia, which for me was a, another, <clears throat> I suppose was it a great lift in my professional career in terms of the, the, you know, the Vietnamese community, Greek. We've just got such a great mix of different cultures and cuisines. I remember wandering down Victoria Street, which is a Vietnamese uh, area in uh, Melbourne, and walking to one of the grocers and picking up things like lily buds, you know, or dried mandarin peel, Xiang mandarin peel, or, you know, fresh rice rolls. And it's just a world of, like, I just look at it and go, wow. So much to learn. And India's been like that for me. Like, you know, I've, I've still got friends that are not chefs, but, you know, I've got a motorcyclist friend of mine. He goes, I just don't get the, what, the fascination with India. I said, you have to go. You're never going to understand it unless you go. It's a bit like that idea of you've never really eaten French food until you're sitting in a little French bistro, you know, tearing a baguette. And, you know, do you know what I mean? It's, uh, you know, eating at a parfait. So that, for me, India kind of, it's, endless like everywhere i go there's something new every you know it can be on the street it can be somebody's home when i was in goa recently and uh you know i went for a family meal with a friend and they and they bought like 30 dishes just dumped it on the table it's just it's i just go oh my god yeah. you know what's this what's this what's this what's this what's this so as a chef i go geez if i could just keep learning like this for the rest of my life it makes me really happy yeah. so why do i bring away from that it, it just changes my family table it changes my constant source of frustration for my wife can I throw this away? Leave it alone. <laughs> What's this? Don't worry about it. Do you, do you know what I mean? Do you cook Indian at home? Yeah, of course I do. Yeah, that's why I watch, you know, stuff that you do, or I watch stuff that, you know, I, you know, I go deep dive on a particular thing. Like, I, for example, you know, and I post just for pure pleasure. I don't yeah. monetize my Instagram. Occasionally, yeah. I remember to post stuff and I do it. Um, but I made Meduvada just because I went. You know what? We were on holiday. I was in Kerala for a, four weeks. I was filming, and then I did two weeks holiday, and. My wife said, I really love those. Can you make that? Why don't you make dosa? So I just did a deep dive on it, got recipes from chefs, played around with it, watched a couple of your videos, watched somebody else's videos. And then I just did a whole kind of wow. couple of weeks of just perfecting it. And when I got it right, I was like, yes. <laughs> and then I posted it. And then, you know, typically the Indian audience goes, Gaz, we don't put this in. We don't do that. And you should never put this in. And I go, and I love that conversation. Yeah. Yeah, so absolutely. Yeah. I, I love that coming from you because I get, the lot, uh, get it a lot, uh, you know, a lot many times that uh, India has so much to offer, but yet people from the outside think that uh, it could be presented in a better way. But what do you feel about it? <laughs> okay. um, <laughs> get yourself comfortable. Uh, let's, let, let, let's start with, okay, Australia, is a, Australia has a 60,000 year culinary history that we've ignored, and we have a 250 year culinary history, that's it. You have, you have people who are fourth, fifth, sixth, 23rd, generation culture makers or proto makers yeah this is this is where finesse comes from by repeating and handing down that knowledge so so for me that that continuity um and that consistency is that's the holy grail for any cook so so i what i worry about sometimes and i think this was the case maybe 
coming here 15 years ago, it was all about replating things differently. Same dish, replated differently. It's like, well, no, what, that's, that does nothing. Stop it. In, yeah. in a big hotel, <laughs> stop it. Either, either use your clouds as a big hotel to find amazing ingredients and support a small grower that no one else can have. So yeah. mm. when, when you and I go to eat in that restaurant, we have stuff that we, we just can't find anywhere else. You know? And for me, there was a moment going south of Mumbai and, and with a friend of mine and having Actually, no, was it here? Actually, I think it was here. We drove out, we drove, we drove west. We drove west here and we went to a restaurant and we had, I had my first Korg vinegar. And it's like, what is this stuff? Ketchum Kordi, what is this stuff? What is this fruit? We've never heard of it. You know, the idea of, 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 of like smoking it, turning to vinegar. It's brilliant. That's just one element. That's all round. And so I think, I think rather than debating how you replate stuff, it's champion that, you know, find a maybe a lighter, brighter way of making the dish that's more in keeping yeah. with perhaps how we all eat now, we eat mm. less sugar, less fat, you know, find that without losing its essential essence. Mm. But that's where the joy is. The, the joy is beautifully thing, beautiful things done really well and then something that's unique. That Juan Marie Azak, a famous Spanish chef, uh, once told me, he said, you want to be able to sit at a dining room table and shut your eyes and eat the food and know exactly in the world where you are. Mm, absolutely. That's, Isn't that's that perfection. That, and, and that's, that's, <laughs> that's what's so exciting now with what's happening with Indian cuisine, is that's what's happening. Mm. The, 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 it, the form may have changed, but, but you taste something, you go, oh, I know exactly what that is. And even with my limited knowledge, for you wow. that's had, you know, when it's 30 years of experience on this planet trying that thing, it becomes transcendental. Then you go, oh, that's exactly what my grandmother made, but it's so light and airy and it evaporates in my mouth and it's, and that, that's that connection yeah. between history and that idea of respecting tradition but not being chained by it. Mm. And that's what I think we're seeing now. And this is the amazing thing with lockdown. We're starting to see that with a lot of young, young chefs. I mean, we went to Bombay Cantinas yeah. like that. I think there are a lot of, there are a lot of younger, next-gen next gen chefs coming through yeah. um, doing exactly that. And that's, that's super exciting. Yeah. Like f 10 years ago, or we talk about, I mean, everyone would be asking us about atel culture, Vinit Bhatia, um, Vickers Canis. They'd be asking about, about NRIs, right? No, we don't, I don't. You haven't mentioned them. We haven't mentioned them once. Oh, we, we have. We have to. We but, do the, the no, Sanjeev no, Kapoor and yeah. these no, guys. No, Sanjeev Kapoor's a different. Yeah. Sanjeev Kapoor's <laughs> a different deal. He's, he's, he's here and he's, he's the Margaret Fulton. He's the Julia Childs of India. He's, a, he's absolutely right. He's a Jacques super, Pepin. He's a super. He's a super yeah. We call him the Amitabh Bachchan of the. Yeah. The world. <laughs> that's, right. yeah. Yeah. that's exactly. And so, so I think, but I think that's exciting I, because I think sometimes and Australia and India are very similar like that. Mm. There's a, a slightly worrying trait we both have of, of are we worthy? Is our food worthy? It's self-deprecating. Yes, you know, but it's yeah. no self-deprecating implies that so it, it's it's actually putting us all lack down. of confidence. It's, or? it's lack of confidence. Mm. It, it's a it's like a you know have cultural cringe. You know, our culture isn't as good as the American culture normally. Mm. This is culinary cringe. We sit there and going, it isn't as good as the French. And that was that great thing that René Rizepi taught the world, was like, celebrate what you've got right here. Right. Because it is amazing. Yeah. That's special. And that's what, and I want to travel. I don't want to travel and eat pizza in India. I want to travel and eat something that's totally unique and I can get excited by it. And like Gazzy, Gaz says, I can take it back in my bag and I can make corn chicken yeah. back in Australia. Yeah. That's right. fantastic. You know, but it's happening in Australia too. I mean, the, the, the joy for me is, uh, I think some older chefs get really kind of uptight about um, young chefs coming up and doing a better job. I love it. It's one of my great pleasures. I love going to a restaurant and going, wow, it's a classic recipe mm -hmm. presented in an entirely different way. I would never have imagined that. Or, you know, with an addition of ingredient or removing ingredient. And, you know, even George now has become an older statement, statesman. But he, he's my go-to as a 57-year-old chef turning to a 45-year-old chef. When he replates my dish, I go, I like that. Mm -hmm. because, but then when, now it's happening to him. Because as a 45-year-old chef, he can give it to a 25-year-old yeah. and he can go, oh, I like that. Because it's just, and it's happening all over the world, which is lovely. I think... There's a coming of age, in a sense, yeah. in, but for every generation. Yeah, but It was I, brilliant for every I generation. I think there's a lot to learn from here because it's exactly the same way I feel. I just wanted to stir this a little bit because I wanted to get this out from you. Yeah. Yeah. And we need to be really proud of our cuisine because yeah. uh, it's uncommon and it's it's so diverse that I always say this that yeah can I say one thing yes I, I think this is a really this has been one of the realizations that we've had on this trip and it's part inspired by Gary we think of Indian as a cuisine it's like European being a cuisine 
It's so rich, it's so huge. We have to value each area mm. rather than saying which it, whether whether the food's better here or yeah. there. Yeah. It's like you can't you don't compare Sp Spain to Italy to Greece to to Netherlands. It's exactly the same yeah. thing. Yeah. It's impossible. Isn't and, it? and I think that's and I think that's we've got into this mm. idea of what what is what is Indian food. We would never say about what is Asian food because we know that there's yeah. so many. Yeah, and I think it's I think we all we 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 do this exactly the same thing. Yeah. Um, and the difference being now we know that it's the variety, but. The next generation is when, when, when people come and they want to go just to Bengal to eat that food yeah. and taste yeah. those mustard seeds. It's funny, isn't it? Because journalists often ask, what, what's your favourite? And that's what Matt says. You know, he, say, he says, it's got, I like it. I'm taking it. Because they'll say, what's your favourite Indian dish? And he goes, what's your favourite European dish? You know, and they go, what? Because, you know, what, what one dish encapsulate, encapsulates Indian cuisine? And Matt will go, well, what and one history, dish you know? encapsulates European cuisine? It's impossible. Yeah. It's but, ridiculous. But it's, but it's also because they're looking for a tick of approval. Mm. Yeah, and like, true. And it's like, it, I mean, it really... They want you to say dal makhni. Yeah, that's Or they right. want you yeah. to say, you know, butter chicken. Or they want you to say, you know, it's funny. And, and, yeah. Yeah, and again, we get back to that uh, thing, what you said, you started with, that if it's delicious, you know, it's... Yeah. That's good food. And yeah. I was coming to that by saying that, you know, I always say this, that in one's lifetime, no one can try everything what's available no. in India. No. Even I can't. Impossible. Yeah, absolutely right. You know, yeah. in the next 50 years, if I yeah. travel every corner of this country. Gary's going to try. I'm <laughs> having a good go. Yeah. Well? I, I, I'm, I'm seeing that. <laughs> okay, what's this, what's this, what's this? <laughs> but, you know, I was just thinking about that Dal Makhni. It's funny, isn't it? You know, that, and, and it was one of the things that we would have got, you know, 10 years ago or 15 years ago when we first started coming mm -hmm. in. George describes it. Um, as when he went to a culinary, we went, George and I went to a culinary school, can't remember where it was, and they were trying to teach the kids, this is probably 15 years ago, teach them international food. And we go, what is international food? You know, it's, and obviously it's, uh, you know, it's, a, it's a, a college trying to teach their students to come into hotels and cook bad versions of cabanara. But now what's lovely about the free flow of information, and I did it the other, the other mm -hmm. day with uh, Susan at um, the Taj, is um, I said, can I show you how to make a pizza? Yeah, that's great. You know, because they're making pizza and it's not great pizza. I've told Netan, who's the executive chef, come on, let's change the pizza. Mm. And he goes, yes, chef, yes, chef. We'll see if they do it. But Susan is young and she goes, yeah, I want to share it. So I gave her a recipe. I said, make the recipe. So she made a pulia, she made the recipe. And then I just walked into the kitchen. I had three or four young chefs around me and we stretched a pizza and we cooked it. And she's like, wow. And I said, I'm not really a pizza maker, but I can tell you, if you work on this, I want pictures. Mm. And you, this is yours now. Like you can, yeah. you can bring your little, your little thing to the table at the Taj Santa Cruz. If you can bash out, you know, a great N Neapolitan pizza, I'll be so proud of that. And so, I just want to know what do you think about? Uh, does social media or content right now uh, have an impact on this? Do you feel it's, it's oh. making a difference uh, internationally, oh, especially? Oh, huge! Yeah, huge! Absolutely, I think. It I think it's been an absolute revolution. I think it's, yeah. I think it's democratized recipe writing. I think it's taken it out of the hands of, it was this weird thing, right? That in the past, cookbooks were written by chefs, but they're not cooks, they're chefs. You know, they, they're really good at putting out 150 meals. What, what, what now see now is if you, you've got an absolutely ripping recipe for, you know, anything, yeah. you can put it up. And if people like it, it goes bonkers. Obviously, on the other hand, there's, you know, it has to be authentic, it has to be real, it has to be a real recipe rather than, hey, we throw this together and it looks brilliant. Yeah. I can make, I can make, a, I can make, what's one, my favourite one, I can make a dolce de leche yeah. in the microwave with condensed milk. And it, yeah. if you try it, it's a disaster, right? But yeah. when they pull it out, they open up the lid and it's like, oh my gosh, it's yeah. perfect. It's like, no, it's not, you fixed it. Yeah. And you work yeah. in a food team, you know. Yes, yes. In <laughs> India, they're making that in the pressure cooker. Yeah, in that's India. Right. yeah, that's right. And, and so, so you kind of so I think that I think that ability access to stuff is great. That the challenge is stripping away the challenge is stripping away the stuff that has no validity. Your stuff has validity because you can actually cook it. It's real. You come from the the right place. There's a lot of stuff that's all about look, and and that's a challenge. But in terms of if we want to if I want to spend three hours watching people cook delicious Indian food, I can do that now. In the old days, I have to hop on a plane and fly for twelve hours so and come here in order to do it. And I think that's. I think that, that's amazing. I think that combined with the ability to then send a, you know, put a, co a comment and, and get a response. Yeah. That, how amazing is that? Yeah, imagine the idea now of, you know, you know. Free flow of information. That, that's yeah. right. Gary asking you for well, the whole thing with your, your fish well, mayo. I, 
was an yeah. example. Yeah. We, we, we tried it, we had a dish last time in Bangalore. Uh, it, Alex, was it Alex Sarge? Sa uh, Sarge Alex? Alex? Sarge Alex. Yeah. Sarge Alex cooked, cooked chef, for us. Yeah. Amazing um, South Indian feast. Gary fell in love with fish molly. And then, then, then they were exchanging videos about Gary saying, this has the sauce of, oh, it's not quite right, yeah, try it's this. It's too thick, too thin, and too many yeah, shots. Yeah. That, that, that ability, which mm. wasn't, you'd have to come here and, and do a starch. I think there's still a value in that. We know yeah, that there's a, you know, that there are young Indian chefs in all the great restaurants now around the world learning and bringing, bringing up skills and stuff they'll bring back here, which is super exciting. Yeah. But, but that, I, think, I think that's amazingly exciting. We just have to make sure people don't start making their start making their Rogan Josh with onion powder and garlic powder <laughs> and um, smoked paprika and you know that kind of American spice meat. There's a danger, there's a danger of a, another wave of colonialism which is kind of junk food American whereas previously it was, it was high in French. Yeah. So historically we, we, we labelled on the high in French, but that was the only food worth eating and now there's a danger it becomes that kind of junky yeah. onion powder, garlic yeah. powder. I love the idea though that the good stuff sticks. The good stuff sticks and stays. You know, like it's like molecular gastronomy. You know, even in at my restaurant with Ray, who's my business mm. partner, we were one of the first to introduce a lot of these things onto the Melbourne market. <clears throat> and some of it was awful. Like we look back at it and go, oh. it's awful. But oysters and passion fruit. Just terrible. Just oh. awful. Like you th and George does the same thing because he trained with us. He just goes, oh, they were awful dishes. But then what the good stuff stays. And it's and it, you know, it's like Bombay Canteen the other night mm. when and we've eaten in, we've eaten on the street, we've eaten a bit of high end, you yeah. know, just to refresh certainly George's memory of, of um, you know, good Indian food, wherever, whatever yep. state we're in. Um, but, you know, he just did a, a yogurt um, foam out of an ISI gun and then scattered it with lots of crunchy, delicious things. And you go, that's what, was, that's what it left us. It left mm. us a texture that yeah. we couldn't achieve before molecular astronomy. Or we, like, for example, you know, when I'm flying off to Sri Lanka and I'm doing an event and I'm, and I'm backpacking and cooking Australian lamb rumps for 12 hours at 54 yeah. degrees. You know, that's what it's left us. It's yeah. left us, you know, pinpoint accuracy. You know, digital thermometer. No one knew before molecu that molecular gastronomy wave or before Harold McGee that, you know, if you pop a thermometer into a steak and you cook it exactly to 48 degrees and you rest yeah. it, you're just going to get the same result every time. Yeah. Before, we used to just touch them. You know, we go, I think it's medium rare. And if you cooked a thousand of them, it'd be medium rare. Yes. And if you cook five of them, it'd never be medium rare. Yeah. So I like the idea that good stuff sticks. That's, you know... And, yeah. and just on that thought, I remember when I had to earn the right to a recipe, <clears throat> back in the you know, mid 80s, late 80s when I was training, I remember having to go to the library in search of, 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 of recipes, um, and everything changed. Like now, mm. I could text you and say, yeah. you know, could you just send me that re the thing that you did there? And you go, sure, and you'd send it. Right. That's great. Can I just ask a question yeah. from you? Yeah, sure. What is, what is the, I don't know, number one, or one to three of the, top downloads on your recipes in India? Um, I think uh, the <coughs> most downloaded one on, so uh, it depends on the platform. That's very interesting. Yeah. You know, yeah. it differs from YouTube to Instagram. Sure, yeah, yeah. yeah on Instagram, uh, something which, which is something like what you said, like, you know, someone's doing mm. something in the microwave oven or something like that yeah. would work a lot. And interestingly, I had done one uh, uh, recipe called a uh, I don't know why I called it fries, but uh, yes, I did. So what I did is I took a corn on the cob and I inserted a satay stick and removed it like a row of corn. Yeah. And then I coated it and fried it and put some Indian masalas on top. And just, you can just eat, eat like, it that. like that. Yeah. It got about 100 million views, that one video. Crazy. Uh, this was Facebook, Instagram. But on YouTube, uh, interestingly, these kind Didn't of work. recipes don't work. Yeah, because there is where uh, so it's not appealing to the eight-second attention span. Yes, so there, uh, you know, recipes like uh, something like my home's uh, dal would work, mm. or a pav bhaji from Mumbai would work, or so a vada really, pav. so you so really good yeah. street food. It's, it's interesting. Isn't it? Really good yeah. traditional yeah. food. Yeah. So initially, I used to think, uh, uh, as a cre uh, as a content creator, that side of my brain used to think that you know I need to do more of these recipes where these are famous recipes, right? Yeah. Celebrated recipes, what I yeah. call. Sometimes I call them very commercial recipes as well because it's available everywhere. Yeah, sure, yeah, yeah. Only do that. But uh, a couple of years back, I travelled uh, to Pune, and uh, I went to a uh, you know road roadside restaurant, and they serve black mutton over there. Right. So it's basically goat uh, meat. Yeah. Uh, cooked in a uh, sauce uh, or masala which is black in color. It, it, it gets its color from basically roasting onions and dry okay. coconut yeah, on coal right. fire yeah. and you grind it into a paste That's and right. cook the mutton. Yeah. yeah, it tastes 
looked amazing. amazing. Yeah. So I cooked that and that is like not a search recipe. But today whenever I travel and I meet people from around India, they come and tell me we tried your black mutton recipe. Yeah. It's yeah, a very unusual it. recipe but sure. they love it and they were like, you know, you explored a regional recipe and you gave it to us because we would never have, have See that, known that's a about window. it. Isn't that a window into the, what's happening in India? It really is. It is, absolutely. But, but I also think it's interesting because I think it's also a window into how traditionally cookbooks are written. Yeah. So you, you'd write cookbooks and 80% of the books are, are, are bulk, you know, the, the yeah. YouTube stuff. And then 10% is the stuff just for you, the yeah. editor says. Yeah. You can't do that. And I go, no, I don't want to have it. It's going. And the other 10% is the one that for the media. And the media go, wow, that's clever. But we know that when people come mm. to, when they come to using the cookbook, the one they're going to engage with is that one. But the one that, that will become the family favorite, the one that yep. they will come up to you and say, I love this recipe, mm. will be that. Often that, it'll be that one in, the one in 10. Yeah. It'll be, it'll be the other I, I love the fact traveling around now that I've seen, and you know, I've, you know, like you said earlier, is I've only, people go, oh, you know more about Indian food than we do. And I go, I, I know like a tiny bit. It's just yeah. the dishes that I've eaten, the joy of eating the, and cooking the dishes that I've eaten. Um, but sometimes, yeah, you come across it where you, people go, I, I've never seen, I've, I don't know what you're talking about. We've never eaten that. But, the, but, the, but that's the curse because, because what you end up doing is you end up eating things once in one place and you really need to go back and, and eat it yeah. five times. In yeah. So, so really you know, understand it. it. It always, in terms yeah. of unfolding, there's always not just in terms of breadth of, I've got to go here and try that and try this, but also I need to dig my, you know, my, 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 my fingers in here to work out what a great yeah, dose is, what, yeah. a, great, what yeah. a great gnocchi is. Yeah. So yeah. this is one of the biggest reasons, right? You know, when someone asks me that, why did you choose content creation? Is, um, I used to always think there are so many people who live in India and abroad. Mm who are not fortunate enough to actually go and travel, right? Yeah, like sure. when people from India come to you and tell you that, you know, yeah. you have explored more than us. You just mm. think that it's not, it's not that willingly they are not going to explore. They are they just not that fortunate. Sure. They yeah, don't yeah, have the sure. option to go there. Yeah. Yeah. So what I wanted to always do is, you know, actually explore on their behalf mm. and give them that access, you know, open that window for them. Yeah. And now the next phase of my content creation is going to be more of traveling regional and, yeah. you know, covering right. these recipes and oh, presenting them in the best ways possible yeah. because that's the kind of uh, uh, you know I, I call it like a responsibility or a power given to me by you know mm -hmm. so yeah. many people yeah. so to use it in the best ways possible it is it is a great responsibility and and, and George reminded me um, the other week when we were talking about Antonio Coluccio who's a was a famous um, Italian cook chef restaurateur and you know he how many books did he write i mean it would have been 30 or something yeah, yeah, right. and so you know highly recognizable certainly in the uk famous 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 and um he said to us uh, i'm not sure what season maybe series three he was on was it where we did the italian challenge in ligon street does that ring a bell yeah either way he said to us you've got a great responsibility to get the facts right you know to mm. betray everything that goes on your show everything that you cook um Make sure it's well researched. Make sure it's the right one. Make sure it's the because there's an audience of three million, eight million, ten million, twenty million, whatever it is, watching it. So he said, if you do a risotto, that becomes the right risotto. Yeah. Millions of people are watching it, and we really took that seriously. So we, you know, we, I remember shutting down the whole of filming over mint. Do you remember mint? Because they, you know, one of the revealed ingredients was mint, and uh, we would always check all. You know, we check with the food team. We'd run through the the challenge. And then we go out and I go, that's not mint, that's spearmint. And they mm. go, no, it's been given to us, it's mint. It's from Coles, which is one of the big supermarkets, and it's sold as mint. And I said, I'm telling you right now, when you lift that lid, even state to state, in Victoria, we have a different type of mint, and that's a spearmint. And I said, if we eliminate someone on, incorrectly, on an incorrectly named yeah. ingredient, yep. it's going to be a disaster. So we took, it very, we took that kind of bit, bit mantle very seriously. To give you an idea of how serious, we, <laughs> well, our EP then, then went to one of the leading herb experts in Australia to, oh. break, to break down what it was. And it, what, and it looked like spearmint, but actually it was, it was, it was, it was, it was, it was tea mint. It was Moroccan yeah. green tea oh. mint, which looks like spearmint. So, so if someone says spearmint, then it's wrong. If someone has said mint, it would have been right. So the green. So that level of detail is that yeah. you have the responsibility. Yeah. And so we do this thing with, with pa identifying pastas. You know, every pasta has half a dozen names. A lot of pastas have half right. a dozen names in Italy. So we'd go, how do you do it? 
Because people at the time are going, that's not that. Yeah, that's yeah. not Strozza Pretti. Yeah. Um, so we used to do this, what name on the packet. But so you've got to find, you're just always finding ways to what keep the it benchmark is, yeah. clear and fair mm -hmm. and, yeah. and honest, I suppose. That's what you're and trying to do. That's where, you know, I feel that with, with social media and content, how things have been turned into an independent way, you know, yeah. that uh, there are people uh, who independently curate content now. So they can do that. When there is a production house, there's a media house, everything, when everything comes together, it's very difficult to do that. Yeah, yeah, well, and also, but also that, that's where, that's the challenge for content is it's become a monetized advertising medium. Yeah. It's lost that, that kind of lovely texture of being made by, made by someone who's seen it, tasted it, making it. You can't replicate that with a, with like, you know, a, a script writer and a director and a, a setup. It, it loses, it loses something. And you know, now in, I'm, I'm, my time on Instagram probably is reduced by about half because every other post now is, is monetized. I don't care. I don't want to, don't want to know what you've been paid to tell me. I want to know what you want to tell right. me because it's a personal. The whole point is a personal relationship. Right. And as Gary said, and it's a two-way personal relationship. You tell me, but I may well come back and yeah. ask you a question, then you'll answer it. That's brilliant. That's yeah. connection. That's what we love. But we're talking about it personally. It's no reflection yeah. on you or anybody else that's going yeah, yeah, on. Yeah, absolutely. You know, because in the end, we've lived our lives and we've, we've, occupied, we've occupied a very uh, special place in cooking TV yes. history and influence. And yes. so we, you know, that's very special to us. And actually, you know, even Justine, who's my manager, she goes, you know, two years ago, you need to monetize this. I don't want to, it's mine. It's, you know, if I want to post it, I'll post it. And often I say to Mandy, you know, I'm going to cook dinner and you must remind me to, to uh, film it, you know. And then we eat, we're eating and she goes, did you film it? I go, oh, damn it, I forgot. <laughs> you know, because I've, it's, I've been... It's because we're old. Yeah, no, but, it's you know, we're old, it's not I'll be cooking and something. And I'll be cooking it. something and I go, oh, I'm in it, you know, and I like it and I'm, you know, I'm doing it. And I go, oh, I should have filmed it, you know, because it's great. Because you know that people yeah. want, because people want to see it. Yes. Yeah. And we, we get back to the same thing, you know, keep it, keeping it real, right? Yeah. And that, that's we yeah. get back Honest, to. Honest, real, and, trustworthy. Uh, yes. And that also gets me to, you know, I travel a lot, uh, uh, you know, and when I see Indian food being cooked uh, abroad, uh, we, com we Indians complain about, you know, this is not the right Indian food. Yeah. But then I also realize that uh, when in India, there are certain cuisines being presented, they are again presented in a different way. It's yeah. because of different you know, palate preferences, etc. But what do you feel is, according to you very personally, the right way to present a local cuisine in a different country? I like Indian food outside of India because I, I, I accept, I look at it in a different way. I, I look at it there, you know, people, for example, my, uh, a chef of uh, mine, uh, his name was Peter Kronberg and uh, Mission Star Restaurant in London and he said, um, when I said I was going to Australia, he said, don't go, it'll ruin your career. Shame he passed away because <laughs> it was a, I could have told him it didn't ruin my career. Um, and he said, uh, take something with you that reminds you of home. And he said when, I, he, said when he left uh, Austria, um, he took uh, daffodil bulbs just because he wanted to plant them and have something of home. And so don't forget that every generation of any migrant group you know, whether it's Greeks or Italians, they've taken a little bit of home with yeah. them. And this is why old Italians get into trouble, or Indians particularly get in trouble, you know, because they smuggle things back into Australia. You know, there's seeds from a, from a tomato that, you know, grows on a slope on the northern, you know, do you know what I mean? And yeah. so the, what every migrant group has done is it's taken a little bit of home with them and it's frozen in time. And I like the idea that it's not up to date. And I like the idea that they've adapted it with a local ingredient. And I like yeah. the idea that Indians travel to South Africa or Australia or Britain or Peru and go, well, this is not Indian food. Because it is, but it isn't. And it was. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yes, like, and, and George always, when George set up his own modern Greek restaurant, so many Greeks, would, it drove him nuts. Because all, the, all these Greeks would come in and go, this is not Greek. And he said, when was the last time you went to Greece? And they go, 1974. Because that was when they went yeah. last. And it would be the same with the Indian yes. communities as they've, you know, as they've left and gone to Malaysia or wherever they have in the world. And they've taken that and they've held onto it. And that's what reminds them of home. And in fact, the language, the ingredients, all this kind of thing. So I love it. So when you ask, you know, how is it to be presented? Well, it, 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 it occupies its space, like our lucky mm. space in history. It occupies its space. And I love... G Jim, who's George's dad, loves a sweet and sour pork or a sweet and sour chicken. It's old school Chinese and no, no, um, it doesn't relate to anything other than the fact that that's what those migrants bought, that's what reminded them home. 
reminded them of home and they adapted that recipe and we love it. So embrace it. Do you I don't know if that makes any yeah. sense. But yeah, it, you know? it absolutely does, you know. And that's why I'm asking I, that. I think, I, think a, I think it's a really interesting question because well, I'll, I'll put this to you. If an Indian comes up with a recipe when they live in New York or London, is it an Indian recipe or is it an English recipe? It's I think it, it's an Indian recipe. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So, so, so likewise, if an Italian comes up with spaghetti bolognese in London or, or Adelaide, it's then an Italian recipe. So in a way, it's just another facet of Indian. And this, this there, there are very, very, very few recipes where you can find the authentic original. Butter chicken is probably one of the rare ones. We yeah. know, you know. Gora Bazaar, Peshwar, you know, the three guys that made it, they move over. We know it's, it's all about cumin, it's all about tomato. We know this. Yeah. We have that original recipe written down. You know, they, they, they open the Moti Mahal in Delhi. We, this is it. But you try and put out there that butter chicken shouldn't have kasuri methi in it, and a war will erupt. <laughs> and it's like, it, I, I, and, and I was kind of like... It's a nice discussion, man. And my, my first thing was, well, look, it's not in the original. And, and we, we know because, you know, the grandchildren are still alive. They know that, that, that there's primary source and secondary source we can refer to. But also, so that was my first thing. But then it was like, it doesn't matter. Which no. way do you prefer it? Yeah. It's fine, yeah. but don't, don't get hung up on this has to be the way. Because, because the, way, you're, the way, you're, if, way your grandmother cooked is never going to be the same because the wheat will have changed, the water will have changed. You know, what you're cooking on wood, you're not cooking on st wood anymore. Wood, yeah. Yeah. So it's really, it just gets down to, is it delicious? Mm. And, and us being a little bit less uptight about trying to judge stuff. I say this as a as man, a judge, no, as, as a one-time <laughs> judging critic, but I kind of think there's... Yeah, but when you judge, you always, you always as an as a umbrella, always threw that out there. Yeah. You know, yeah. That, you know yeah. it so, might not be. I always, I use the word, and I like authentic. I like digging down and finding as close to authentic as possible, because what it is, it's the base from where you, you start. Yeah. But I always think that authenticity, people that stick to it, I go, it's overrated. Yes, yeah, sometimes you're too strict with it, and yeah, uh, right. you know. But, but 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 also often they've not done the research. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so they they'll tell you stuff and just go. We had this the other day. That isn't true. Yes. And as well, no, it was made the you know what was it? The I don't know. I can't remember. It was now. California rolls. California oh, yeah, rolls yeah, were made, yeah, yeah. Were made yeah. by an American. Well, no, they're not. They're made by yeah. Japanese people. And a couple of Japanese names yeah. in California. Mm. Are the most likely maybe, maybe that's the maybe that's the that's the negative part of social media is that you know it's the pylon you know like yes. there was a there was yeah. an Australian woman in reminding me of sushi there's an Australian woman in New York that just was accused of cultural appropriation because she was an Australian woman making sushi but making Austra Australian sushi you know like the a version of Californian yeah. rolls and and nigiri and that was her style how on earth you can ch you can uh, accuse people of cultural appropriation when it comes to food. Yeah, because that's I how, just it, go, it's that's just, how food's been, uh, you know, for, going on for forever. centuries. Yeah. For but centuries. a lot of it, we live in a world of a linguistics yeah. now. Not in listen to truth, it's about if you call it something different, it's okay. It's still yeah. the same dish. Yeah. You're yeah. still taking your idea. And let's face it, where did sushi come from? It came from a Burmese hill tribe. So, you know, like did it? Yes. Oh and, my and God, when, I never knew that. Tempura <laughs> came from, you know, Portuguese uh, uh, fried treats for holy days. So, yeah. I mean, this is the whole thing, right? The whole thing about this idea of authentic is the joy of food. And India is, yeah. there's no better place where you can see this. The joy of food is all those different influences. The joy of food is the cat. Where, where did the cashews come from? And the tomatoes come mm. from? The chili come from? Potato come from? The cauliflower. You know, the, where, where the beans, the avocado, you know, all those things. The, the influences of style of cooking, mm. you know, ground, ground nuts and that kind of muggler way. They're, all these ideas all come from somewhere and that's what makes it such a, mm. a, a, such a beautiful cuisine. Otherwise, we'd all be eating stale bread in little squares dunked into, into oh, wow. I mean, it'd be really boring. What are we dunking stale bread into? Uh, I think we're probably dunking into milk. Gravy oh, no. would be nice. I mean, I'd eat stale bread. Yeah, gravy. gravy would be delicious, actually. <laughs> no, actually, absolutely, that's right. And, you know, sometimes we just, you know, people want to make a point by mm. making a negative point. Sure. Because that starts a conversation, right? Yeah. And, and, uh, and also, that is, so, that is social media. Yes, that's social, social media. Social media algorithms re reward conflict. Yes. Which, and that's, I think, a really, that's a yeah. big issue. That's mm. a big issue. And I struggle with that because I... I love this idea where people go, look, it's not the way I make it, but, um, but, but it still looks really good. That's no good. You wanted to say that's disgusting. Yeah, have you been piled on? on? Have you, have um, in anything that not, you've many, done? Uh, not many times. Yeah. Uh, but sometimes, you know, um, like you, I, I did a, a dhokla recipe yep. from Gujarat. Sure. And it's supposed to be, that version is supposed to be called khaman. But I called it a dhokla. 
but some like there are many uh, places in gujarat yeah, 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 where yeah, it so would be called dhokla right. so i i am just like see it's made the right way right you know it's okay mm-hmm. i'll call it khaman but don't make a mess out of it because mm-hmm. i'm just trying to be very positive over here mm-hmm. positive over here and try to just teach people uh, or just share my recipe with the yeah. with the world that mm-hmm. they can just go yeah. and cook and enjoy that meal with their loved ones and that's absolutely that's right. what i want to do people do very, people are, are very lazy too i mean i remember watching a, a an American Italian chef make a particular recipe. I can't remember what it was now. It's pasta recipe, and uh, he just got piled on, and he just kept batting them back, batting them back, batting them back. And I like the fact that he did it because he mm. said, "Listen to the first five seconds of the video. I say yeah, yeah. I'm making this, but I don't have any olives, <laughs> so I'm going to tell you yeah. you can make it without the yeah. olives." And he made the dish, yeah, yeah. and everybody went, "Where's the olives?" And this yeah. is not, this yeah. is it, and this is yeah. it. And I just yeah. love it. Yeah, because because again, people are reacting to. To the name of the dish, and they're reacting yeah. to what they think they're going to hear, yeah. Yeah. and that's always. Anyway, a it's a great resource. I love it. Yeah. So for the younger generations who are now just getting on to become chefs, a lot of people want to become mm-hmm. chefs now. Sure. Um, I always apologise in advance. They go, "I became a chef because of you," and I go, "Was it a good thing?" <laughs> <laughs> it was like yeah, you know when we were at Noma. We were at Noma, and we had oh a little God, tour of the kitchens yeah. afterwards, and there was a table of like ten young kids, and they're all picking Slides like tiny ones. little. You know, I don't they're know, peeling, sheets They're of peeling wheat. peas. They're peeling peas. Well, yeah. They're taking a pea and they're peeling the outside yeah. of the yeah. other two halves. That's what they And they were doing it for hours. And I just, I just, this young Indian girl said to me, she, uh, as Matt and George, uh, no, it was just you, actually. Yeah. You, you went walking off and she called my name and she said, I have to tell you that the only reason I became a chef was because of you guys. And I said, oh my God, was it good? <laughs> was that a good idea? Like, because obviously she's yeah. working, working very hard. She's a stagiaire and she said, is the best thing I've ever done. So I always yeah. kind of preface it. But I'm, I'm sure there are many in India who uh, are going to take that decision just watching you. So Possibly. There are many. I, I know of uh, <laughs> personally as well. But, that, but, um, that, but that's why we're passing the mantle on to you. That's your job now to continue with yeah, that. Thank right. you. And I'll, 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 have it. I'll do my... I, you I'll, can have it. We'll just watch. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll do my level best and I'll uh, you know work really hard on it. It's, it's just the beginning for me, I feel. Yeah. Um, but if you could just maybe two or three things, um, your learnings from your careers when you started. I, I, I just don't want to confine it to your professional careers, but sure. the moment you started cooking or you started your conversations with cooking, from there on till now, if you would want to, like, it's very difficult, but want to sum up and tell like two mm. or three things to the younger people right now, that what would get them ahead in life in the food space? What yeah. do they need to look for? Okay, I'll give you, I'll give you four. Number one, Two ears, one mouth. Listen more than talk. I think that that's probably straightforward. Number two, listen because opportunity knocks really quietly. That's also really important. Number three, never underestimate the fact that why people go out is not to eat your food. They go out to have a really good time with their friends and your job is for your food and your service to enhance that experience. That's why you're eating wow. out. Wow. That's really important. There may be five or six restaurants that, that where, it's a, where it's like a Noma or a Central where it, maybe it's a, a gastronomic pilgrimage. And the third thing is cook stuff you want to eat, cook for pleasure, don't cook to show off for your peers. Mm. Because when people cook to show off for their peers, it often alienates the, the, the people eating there and it also becomes a bit soulless because it's not, it's not the stuff you really love. Mm. What about, what about you, Chef? Mine's going to be far more professional and chefy, isn't it? Um, look, I've trained, a lot of, I've trained a lot of young people over the years. And I think, you know, my, one, my, one, my first bit of advice is to find a mentor. You know, find someone that really mm-hmm. takes a genuine interest in your career and somebody that uh, has a vested interest in your career. You know, you don't want to be screaming shout out. You don't want to work in a kitchen where you, you, you're ignored. You don't want to be working in a kitchen where, you know, you're not moving around, you're not learning. You need to be encouraged by someone to, to, to they need to be, you know, fueling that fire and inspiring you. So really, really important. You know, I've, I've told lots of young chefs, you enjoying where you're working? Uh, not really. Move, just go, move, find someone else. And if it takes you three or four places to find that, then do it. Some people search a lifetime, you know, to find a mentor that they can really, have, you know, mentors that I've, I, I've had and hopefully I've mentored other people that you stay connected to and you know you can take that journey together um, so that's number one and, and also the fact that it's you know if you really want to be lots of people now lots of young kids now obviously want to do what you do they want to be a, a, a content creator and that's great I think the lovely thing about the industry now is that you can follow many different paths in food but but the in 
what I've done in, in terms of being a chef and a restaurateur. That's what I can advise people to do. And um, that takes a lot of... Com if you want to be really good at something, you, just didn't, you need to do it a lot. You know, and they, they often say, what's the secret, chef? I go, you just need to do it a lot. You need to do it enough so that you don't actually have to think about it too much anymore. And that there's, that's when the joy comes for me, is when, the, when you're cooking and you're not thinking too much and there's a rhythm, you know, there's a, uh, yeah, there's a rhythm to it, then you know that you're on the right path. And, and the last one would be, um, I mean, somebody gave me this advice many years ago, is try not to draw a line in the sand between work and play. It's really hard in hospitality, not in possibly other areas, you know, whether in manufacturing or whatever, but it's, um, it's really hard to be able to uh, go, this is work and this is play. I've, I've put the two together and, and they, they flow beautifully. You know, when I'm eating out, I'm working, but I'm having fun. You know, when I'm walking down the street and I'm in the market and I'm shopping and it's a chore, it's, 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 it's fun or it's, it's just part of that foodie world that you're in. And the, the friends that you have that are constantly ringing you on a Friday night and a Saturday night going, where are you? You're always working on sociable hours. Get rid of them. Get new friends. Get hospitality friends. Get people that you can go out with at 12 o'clock at night and sit in a little bar and have a martini and talk about, you know, the day you've had. And so it's, a, and then when you, later on in your life, you know, so if you do all those things and you work hard and you've got the right mentor and the right connections and you've done things many, many times and you're good at what you do, surprisingly, the success seems to come. I don't think it's rocket science. And many people fall away just because at some point, you know, it is, it's all got on top of them or it didn't give them the rewards they want. Well, it's hard. Well, it's hard. It's, it's, hard, it's, it's, well. hard, it's to, hard and repetitive. You know, like I, I, I look at the simple things. Like, you know, when I was in uh, Madurai uh, recently, you know, in Tamil Nadu. Is it Madurai? Madura. Madurai. Yeah. So, um, and I'm watching this young man. It's on my Instagram and he's just throwing a, a parotta. Like it, it's, and he's smiling at the camera. He's not looking at the parotta. I could never make a product mm. like that in my yeah. life. But that is a skill. That is yeah. something you could take and you can monetize and you can do whatever you want with. And so, you know, if you found all those things, if you do all those things, to get really good at it, to have that kind of craft, you know, there, there's, a, there's a real pleasure in that. I look at my grandfather who, in his retirement, was just a happy guy, a happy man. He had a good life. Smiled and talked to everybody. It's not a bad place to be. There's amazing insights and so much to learn. And uh, I'm sure everyone who's... Uh, you know, watch this is going to take back something really good uh, and to act on, uh, so. act upon in their lives. And it's been a pleasure, Chef, and so uh, mm -hmm. to do this with you. Super. Um, I had a lot of fun, but I have learned a lot. And, uh, <laughs> uh, and maybe we'll get a chance to cook together sometime. Yes, yeah, 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 I would yeah, love yeah. to cook some good Indian food for both Or maybe we we'll just sit there and he can cook for us. Uh, Much yes, better. I yes, we should right. do and that. that well, uh, that's content. <laughs> Much better. We'll, we'll sit there and eat. You cook. Yes. I like that idea. Yeah. Yes, in fact, my best friend uh, has just moved to Australia, Sydney. Mm -hmm. He uh, uh, does uh, culinary arts from uh, LCB okay. uh, from Sydney. So he's moved with his wife. So my best friend and my wife's best friend are married together. Oh no, we've got to go. We've got to come. <laughs> so they are in Sydney. So I'm going to come over very soon. Sure. And let, uh, us know. let us know when you're there. We'll yes, give I you... Cook. Matt's a great resource. I even call Matt. I go, where, where do I need to go and eat? What's the newest place? He's a great resource. No, but more than that, I would love to come and cook yeah, for you. Yeah, and uh, we will yeah. do that. You'll have to come to Melbourne. Yes, yes, because, why not? You yes. You've got, you got, you got to see the MCG. Yes, absolutely. You've got to see that. Home of cricket, is oh, yes. he, he and did it. He brought it back to can, cricket. And you can do that. You can go. Oh, that's, that's it disgusting. started with cricket. It ended. No, I think cricket. we are going to like kind of feel a little better by winning the bilateral series right now. Yeah. T21. We won the first yeah. match. Yeah, you'll, so defi you'll definitely win that. You'll yes, definitely we'll win that. win that, and then it'll be. <laughs> and, and, yeah. then, and then it's all going to come. But that, it all builds to the test series. The next yes, big it test does. series. Guys, guys, stop. That's exciting. And thanks for watching. Sorry. It's been a pleasure being on. Yes. Yeah. And yeah, we'll hold you to it. You're cooking for us. Yes. Thank you so yeah, much. Thanks. Lovely thanks. Lovely. That's it. It was wonderful. Great. Wonderful. Thank you, Leslie. Great chat. I am so <laughs> thirsty. I was just, I kept <laughs> yeah, looking I, at the bottle of water. I looked at you and I was. <laughs>